of you, we've had uh, a fire down on Marco Polo building, and uh, we had people that died. And I'm just going to read uh, Pastor Phil uh, Reller, his pastor of Pearl City Community Church, lost his mother and brother in the fire. And there's, there's real need for blessing and healing. And some of you are coming today with, with other grief. We just sung about the healing that Jesus brings in his hands. He heals relationships. He forgives. Some of you have issues physically where you're asking the Lord to heal you and work in your bodies. So I just want to take a minute as Cam, Cam plays and that we ask the Lord to come and bring his healing in our midst, okay? Can we do that? And if you want the Lord just to touch your life or to, through you to touch someone else that you're praying for this morning, you just lift your hands to him or whatever you feel comfortable with. So, Father, thank you that the power to heal is here right now in the name of Jesus. And so, Father, we pray your healing for those who are grieving over the loss of, of family members with this tragic fire, for those, Lord, who are displaced in their homes, Lord, we, we pray for those today right here in this service, Lord, that are calling out to you for healing in their bodies. Lord, we speak against cancer. Lord, we speak against all manner of disease. Lord, we speak against physical disease and against mental disease. God, that you would come and you would bring healing in the name of Jesus. Lord, we speak to those families that are going through real time of upheaval. Lord, we pray the life and the power of Jesus and the healing into marriages, into relationships between children and their parents and brothers and sisters. Father, those that are struggling financially and, Lord, have anxiety in their hearts, Lord, that you would enable them to walk on water with you when it seems like there's nothing under their feet. Jesus, that you would carry us as your people. Lord, those that are under attack here and around the world. God, that you would provide protection, supernatural protection. God, we haven't come here just to go through motions. God, that you would release your power from heaven into our lives and into your church. God, do mighty miracles and great miracles in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. You've called us together. Now, Father, open our hearts. Father, open all these areas you want to touch in us right now. And we lift up the name of Jesus, our Savior, our King, and our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We thank you. Amen. Let's give the Lord a real praise offering today. Thank you, worship team, and thank you, Cam. I want to look at Luke chapter 9. Uh, Luke chapter 9, we're going to be studying this pivotal chapter for the next uh, three weeks or so. And as we look at the missionary heart of God and what it means to know and to follow this God of miracles. So many people want uh, to see the power of God at work. And you're, you can imagine the disciples, they saw Jesus walking on the water. Um, they saw the power to heal people's lives and they wanted to enter into that kingdom and we call that discipleship and we're going to be looking at what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, what it means to make disciples and to be participating in making disciples with Jesus in this chapter. I wasn't going to preach on this section, I was going to skip further ahead, but I really wanted to to start at the beginning of Luke 9. So please open your Bibles with me or open your phones or whatever you've got as we want to let the Word of God penetrate uh, through to us that we can learn uh, to not only grow in who we are individually in Christ, that's what we call a disciple, a follower of Jesus, but that we can also take these principles into those we are teaching and those of you that are parents, into your children, uh, those of you that are grandparents, into your grandchildren, into your friends and your friendships, into your relationships. This is the stuff when we talk about making disciples that is absolutely central for each one of us. So let's take a look at Luke chapter 9, beginning at the first. I'm going to go through to verse 11. When Jesus had called the 12 together, 
He gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. And if people do not welcome you, leave their town and shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So they set out and they went from village to village proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was going on and he was perplexed because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead, others that Elijah had appeared and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see Jesus. But when the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. And when he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida, but the crowds learned about it and followed him. And he welcomed them, and he spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and he healed those who needed healing. Three times, did you see it in the passage? It talks about Jesus, the proclaiming of his kingdom that something radically new of God has entered into the world, and we call that the kingdom of God, and it came with the coming of Christ, the authority and the power to heal, to forgive, to make lives new. But then we have also the, not only the proclaiming, but the acting out of this kingdom, and it's seen in healing all kinds of needs. And the healing of the kingdom begins with the healing of sin and of forgiveness. That my relationship with God can be put right again. It, it is the healing of, of sin in our relationship. But that includes also the healing of our bodies and the healing of anything else that is moving toward death away from the life that God has called us to in Jesus Christ. And you see it three times. You see it at the beginning when Jesus talked to his disciples in the very beginning in verse 2 of chapter 9 of Luke. Then you see it in this um, later on where, where Jesus himself is healing at the very end of verse 11. And then in the middle of verse 6, these disciples are going out and they're doing it. They're proclaiming the kingdom and they're healing. And this is, is a, a key key chapter for us in understanding the heart of God when it comes to discipleship. I want us to read together verses 1 and 2 again. When Jesus had called the 12 together, read it with me. When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal. Now notice, he called them together. And he called them together to give them power and authority. We'll come back to that. But then he sends them out. And he sends them away from him. Discipleship has two sides. Some of you want to know, how do I make How do I make disciples? I have someone coming to me. They want to learn how to grow in Jesus. Or I want to grow in Jesus and be discipled. There are two sides to the coin, two aspects. The first is you have to learn to come together in Christ. You're called together. He called the 12 to him. Now, this was true for the the 12 apostles in Luke 9. It's also true for the disciples. There are more than 70 of them in the next chapter, in Luke chapter 10. And then we see this all through Acts as well. There is this coming together to Jesus, called together, but then sending out the two sides. And if we're going to understand discipleship and how to grow and disciple in, in, in our walk with Jesus, but also how other people to grow, Those two sides have to be there. The coming together, the calling in, and then the sending out in the name of Jesus. 
Now, I've just come back with my wife, Trish, from three glorious weeks. It, it was sort of like a second honeymoon. It was really nice. I had no computer. I had off the grid and the phone, and we got to, there's no one around, and this beautiful lake. We would swim up and down the shore of the lake. The water wasn't quite as warm as here. It was about 60 degrees, but you know, when you're with your sweetheart, that doesn't matter, and so you're swimming along. We had a wonderful time, but we're basically living outside. We have uh, 100 acres on a lake that we've had since the 1980s, and it just pioneered and etched out a little space. So you're living outside and cooking. You have to imagine a big fire pit where we have logs, and we cook over wood, our breakfast, our lunch, our suppers, all over wood, and, uh, and big trees overhead that have all grown and matured. And so there's bugs and birds and beauty and all that kind of stuff around there. And... Um, one, one classic line from, from our time is uh, I was eating and we, we cook, uh, as I said, outside and we made a stew and so different things get in the stew. And so I was eating and I said, Trish, I, I feel like I've got a pine needle stuck in my tooth. She said, no way, you don't have a pine needle. And, so, and then I looked and sure enough, I pulled this pine needle out from my tooth that I got in the stew. That was kind of how it was when you're living outside in a very, very different world. But discipleship is how do we follow Jesus, whether you're living outside and cooking over wood and, and swimming in cold, fresh water, or whether you are at Ala Moana and you're in warm ocean water and you're in a whole different context. The following Jesus, the principles that we learn, apply anywhere, every person, anywhere, anytime in the world. And these are principles of how do we walk with Jesus wherever he calls us, whoever we are. The first thing that we find in Luke 9, the, the passage kind of zeroes in. There's these three arrows that point to ultimate questions. And the most important ultimate question is who is this Jesus? We saw it first asked, by Herod in verse 9 of chapter 9 of Luke. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And that is the first ultimate question you really need to settle if you are going to be a, uh, become a disciple of Jesus. A lot of people like Herod, they take note of the miracles. They knew this wasn't just any ordinary guy. There were so many miracles that he said, hey, it has to even be someone raised from the dead like John the Baptist or an ancient prophet. He is that powerful because no one living an ordinary life could do what he did. He did. But who is he? And so the first question that needs to be answered in terms of discipling is that we need to answer, who is Jesus for you? How do you answer that question? Who is Jesus? Because until you can answer that question, you're not ready to be discipled. A lot of people want the healing. A lot of people want to grow. A lot of people want the excitement of seeing God at work. But the first step of discipleship is answering the question, who is Jesus? Because everything else hinges. Is he your savior? Is he the Lord? Because if he is Lord. Now, the second time in this chapter, Jesus asks this question, and he says the same thing to the disciples. Who did the crowd say that I am? I think that's around verse 19, verse 18. And the disciples answer the same things that Herod said. He said, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others this long-ago prophet has showed up. But then Jesus says, who do you say that I am? You see, Jesus cares about your answer to that question. Because discipleship begins with a relationship with Christ. And if you are going to disciple someone else, it needs to begin with them answering that question. There's a lot of ways we can love. There's a lot of miracles and powerful things that God can do in people's lives. But discipleship begins when you know who Jesus is. He is the Son of God. And that's what, that's what Peter said. You are, you are the Son of God. You're the Christ. You've come down from heaven. But then as soon as we get that answer, there is a second fundamental question 
that we need to answer, and that is, what is Christ's purpose for me? You see, if I believe that Christ is Lord, if he is the one who took my sins on the cross, who died and rose again, then, Lord, what's it with me? Why am I here? How can I serve and obey you? Because discipleship is always teaching us how to obey what Christ is calling us to do and to be. What is Christ's purpose? How do I follow him? How do I serve him? I want to read verse 23 of Luke 9. This, I think, is, is the key verse. If I was to choose any one verse in this whole chapter, I'll be coming back to this the next few weeks. And Jesus summarizes what it means to be a disciple and to make disciples. Let's read this together. Then Jesus said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple, let's try that again, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. There is this daily change of how we live. Discipleship is about God changing us and then leading us in a daily walk in his kingdom. And discipling someone else is about helping them to grow in obeying who Jesus is, becoming like him in character and in action daily in their own lives. And it's really an issue of living a self-centered life with me at the center or a Christ-centered life, which the Bible calls a selfless life. Jesus describes that in 24, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And so there is this contrast of kingdoms, the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God that is begun when we answer the ultimate questions, who is this Jesus and what is Christ's purpose for me? Are you aware of Christ's purpose for your life? Because Jesus wants you not only to know him, but the fulfillment of what it means to live in the power of his kingdom. This discipleship needs to be, it's a decision. We have to decide if we are going to be disciples. Our salvation is fully a work of God and of his grace. We just receive that. But in order to grow and to follow Christ, there is a decision and a commitment that has to take place in our hearts. And this is not a light matter, and that's why some of you that are visiting, you will see people in church, they visit, and it's great, and they love the worship, and they get all excited, and they love to see the healing, but then it gets tough, and they quickly are thrown aside, and they're not there anymore. Sometimes it can look like hypocrisy in a church, where people with great needs show up and they come to church, but then it gets tough because discipleship is tough. Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you've got to deny yourself. You've got to take a cross that's carry your casket with you on your back wherever you go. And, and, and he talks about it in other places. He said, there's a wide open path. It's easy for anyone who wants to walk in the kingdom of the world. But if you want to walk with me in my kingdom, it's a narrow path. And that's the path of discipleship, and it's tough. So there's a decision that needs to be made. And don't be discouraged when people kind of bounce around like a pendulum because they kind of step in and say, yes, I really want the things of Jesus. Then it gets tough, and they back up a bit. And then they say, okay, God, I, I really need you. And there's this back and forth until there is cemented in our hearts, Lord, I surrender who I am to you. Come, lead me. So this deciding on discipleship. If we look at verse 1, we see that it begins with answering this call to come together with God's people, with Jesus at the center. Verse 1 of Luke 9, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority. He called the 12 together. Now, this may seem really simple for many of you, but I can't tell you how many times people have said, you know, Pastor, I want someone to disciple me. Or I've had Pastor Kendall say, we've got all these youth who want to be discipled, and they want to grow in Jesus. And I say, well, great. The first step, if you want to be discipled, is you obey and respond to the call of God to be together with God's people. 
oh, but I want to be a disciple, but I don't want to be in church. Well, no, you, you won't be. Because the first step of discipleship is to be together with God's people. There may be other things that God will do in your life, but it won't be discipleship until you learn that the very core, you first have to come together with Christ and together with his people. So that means that, that your priority shifts to gathering on Sunday with God's people. You're, you're, that, that becomes this nail. We have 12-inch spikes that we use in the bush to, to, to nail logs together. And you take a five-pound mole and you smash that pig through. And Sunday is this pig-down time and event in our life that doesn't move because that's the heart of discipleship. You get together with God's people. Please... Be careful of the lie that the enemy says over and over and over that somehow you can grow and walk in Jesus and not first respond to be together with his people. It's not there. And it won't happen. And so much of discipleship or, or dis disturbance or discouragement around discipleship is because they want to be discipled, but they don't want to do the first step of who is Jesus and then the second step of coming to him together with his people. I do a lot of counseling, and I love counseling, and praise God for bringing Sarah, and, and she can help free me up to be more of a pastor and less of an administrator. Praise God. I want to be a pastor, and I want to be there for you. But so much of counseling, people want help with their situations, how to parent, how to, how to grow in, in their business, how to be godly in moral decisions, how to be a better husband or wife, and all these things are great. But but the foundation stone is first get together with God's people and with Christ and the bulk of the other things you're dealing with will now have a context in which God can lead you forward and bring answers. But we can put magic pills all over the place, but if you don't have this number one, it won't happen. Okay? So this decision to discipleship is first answering the call to come together with Jesus. Um, I was visiting a, a church I pastored 30 years ago, and, and there was a lady, she had MS then, and she still did, and I saw her, and she was in this motorized wheelchair. And so, at the end of the service, I helped her get down the wheelchair ramp, and, and she went away, and we hugged each other. And then I stayed and visited for half an hour or, or longer with other people. And as, as Trish and I were driving, this is not in the city, this is in the country, driving down these country roads, no sidewalks, we see Linda... And, and I mean, she, she's just got her joystick. And she is miles down the road, going all the way to her home. So much did she value gathering with God's people that she spent untold energy and effort to get ready and get in that chair and to drive the miles there in this little motorized wheelchair. And weather in Canada is not like here. <laughs> it's not all sunshine and warmth. And this desire, deciding to be a disciple is first, I will do what it takes to be with God's people. That's why we're starting another service Saturday night. Because some of you say, hey, I have to work a shift on Sunday or other things, and, and we want an opportunity where you can gather with God's people. That's why with Pastor Clyde, we have eight different times this week and every week for the next 12 weeks where you can come and you can have expert Bible teaching and learn, and you can study together with God's people, some of which you haven't met. It's because it's the first step of discipleship. But some of you say, oh, I want to grow. I want to see the miracles of Jesus, but I don't want to get together with God's people. Well, God bless you and God love you. But when you decide you want to take the first step, then we'll take the second step. So then we have not only the answering call to come together, but receiving the Lord's mantle, mantle of power. When we come together as God's people, God gives to him, God gives to his disciples two things. One is power and authority. We see again this in chapter 9, verse 1 of Luke. He gave them power and authority to drive out all demons. Do you want that power? <laughs> wow! There is nowhere you can go in the enemy's territory that an enemy has any weapon over you. 
Wow, that's a power. And an authority. Not only does he give you the ability, he gives you the right. This is what, what Jesus longs for us as his disciples to have and to know. We are qualified and we are authorized for every challenge, for every battle, for every obstacle, for every hardship, over all demons. And people often call and say, you know, there's something weird going on. Can you come and cleanse our house? Can you come and, and, and pray over my friend? And what's the answer? Yes, of course. He's given us power over all demons. But you know what? I'll come gladly. I'll be part of the team, but you have that power and authority too if Jesus is there at the center of your life and you are growing as a disciple because that's what Jesus gives his disciples. To bring the power of the kingdom of God. So answering the call, receiving the Lord's mantle of power, and then and we're going to pray for that mantle of power in the service that God will give that to us. But then the third thing is he sends us out to preach and to heal. Some of you know that um, what, part of what I love, our, our property in Canada is called Isaiah 40. We name it that for lots of reasons, um, but part of it is because there are eagles there, and Isaiah 40 talks about the waiting upon the Lord, renewing strength, mounting up with wings as eagles. Well, there's an eagle's nest, and uh, baby eagles are just as big as their parents, only they're really cumbersome and they look really awkward. And they don't have the golden head and the golden tail feathers. And, and so there is this one baby eagle that we were watching flying around. But an eagle's nest is about yay big, depending. And you can see this great big bird sitting in the nest. But what happens after that baby eagle grows for a time? And the parents get tired of bringing food to him all the time. What do the parents do? That, that daddy eagle and that mother eagle, they just sort of nudge him closer and closer to the edge. And they just kind of keep, and he's going, no, I like it in this nest. It's really cozy in here. And, and then he looks down and goes, whoa, it's a long way down there, mom and dad. I don't want to go there. They say, that's okay. That's why God gave you wings. He says, no, I'm going to stay in my nest. And what they do is they push that little eagle out over the nest and they teach him to open his wings and either the mom or the dad flies underneath him with their wings until he finds those currents lifting him. Because that baby eagle is meant to soar. And there are things that mom and dad will never ever teach that baby eagle if he stays in the nest. Never teach him how to ride thunder clouds. Never teach him how to look three miles and see a mouse and catch it. Never teach him how to fly over the ocean and swoop down and pick up the salmon on the surface. All of those things have to be taught, but you have to fly first. And as Christians, there's so many of us, praise God, we have a church with people that know how to fly. We really do. We really do. And I have learned so much by people putting their wings underneath me and helping. But some of you, maybe you haven't got there. Maybe you're still sitting in the same Sunday school class, but you haven't led anyone to the Lord in a long time. Something of disconnect there. You need to be pushed out of that nest. It may be a really nice nest, maybe a really good class, but maybe you need to keep taking the class but be pushed out of the nest and learn to fly and apply the things you're learning. And we're starting as a church, we're start, starting the Alpha program in the spring, sorry, in the fall, in September, and we're all going to be doing it together. And this is a glorious opportunity to answer the key question of who is Jesus? And what is the life that he calls us to? But if, if it's just a group of Christians sitting around studying stuff they already know, well, that may be great and good videos and wonderful material. But that doesn't cut it. You see, God wants to kick us out of the nest and say, hey, go, go. You find some people that don't know Jesus yet. And you bring them and you gather. And then you see the power of God manifest. So there is, in this deciding to disciple, yes, there's this coming together. That's one side. And without it, no discipleship happens. But then there is the sending out. 
And unless there is this sending out of impacting and you going out into the schools and the world and the workplaces with the power of Jesus, you're going to get stuck in discipleship. The third thing we see is this needing to trust God's provision. What's the same as, this is a riddle, how is a penny the same as a disciple? How is a penny the same as a disciple? Both are one cent. It's okay. A disciple is sent. And that's, that's how we're made to be sent, to be sent and, and to rise up. Um, but in being sent, there is this trust of God's provision. Very quickly. Uh, you see in verse 3 of John of Luke 9, Jesus told them, okay, I'm sending you out. You're going to proclaim the kingdom. You're going to heal the sick. Same for us. Then he said, I want, don't want you to take anything. <laughs> no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. I have been blessed with a wife that lives really simply. I don't have a wife that has 14 suitcases beside, behind her in a caravan. No. Three times we've had to sell everything in our home and just go with the suitcase we have in our hands. Why? Because that's all you need. Because where you're going, God will provide for you. And I've said this, of all the glorious, wonderful uh, things about missions in, in the United States and about United States missions organizations, they have one very, very bad reputation in the world. And that is that wherever U.S. missionaries go, they bring a whole container of stuff with them and it shipped. And so when we had a, 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 a missionary from the U.S. come, we had to send trucks and vans and everything to get all the stuff with them to receive them. You get someone from another country, no, they just come with their suitcase. And Jesus says, you want to be very focused. You want to be very clear here. There is a trust in God's provision. Why don't you need to take anything? Why don't you need the extra stuff? Because he's already got it there for you waiting where you're going. I had a library with thousands of books in Canada. Thousands. I inherited three libraries. I, I could have boxed them all up and brought a whole, little, literally, it's bigger than the library we have here. I could have boxed them all up and paid the money and shipped them all out and built shelves and brought them here. No. God said, you got a library waiting here and someone's trying to give us another library. And another. There's, God has provided what we need wherever we go. And, and that's true. When we are in the middle of the heart of the mission of God, you don't need all the extras. You can travel light. And, and because stuff becomes a minus, not a plus, in the kingdom. And praise God, we're in a church, and we realize that we're not here to just acquire more stuff. We're not here just to build more buildings. All those things have a place and a value. But the value is only in so much as they enable us to move forward to touch people's lives, minister for him. So nothing's lacking. Trust his provision. Why? Because everything is provided. You have everything overflowing that you need of the kingdom of God. You have power even over demons. So why would you worry about if you brought your third set of underwear? Okay? You've got what you need. You don't need three pillows because God is big enough. He's big enough to push back demons. If he's big enough to raise the dead and heal the sick, then he's big enough to find you a pillow to put your head on. And he has already given you everything. You are equipped with the power over the enemy. You are filled up with the Holy Spirit overflowing and you are focused. You're not distracted with what's in the world and what's about the world. Your purpose is not to accumulate stuff. Your purpose and my purpose and our purpose is to proclaim the kingdom of God and bring the healing life of God to people's lives. So if you get hung up on wanting stuff or if you get hung up on stuff being an issue on your obeying God or not, we've got some, got some things to sort out. God, can I really trust you? Are you really good? as good as Scripture says you are. Okay, I trust you to provide. 
And then fourthly, trust God to provide through people. Luke 9, verse 4. So take nothing. You don't need it. God's going to provide for you. But then whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. And if people do not welcome you, leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. This has become such a helpful verse for me. Whenever you are pushed out of the nest and you're finding yourself in uncomfortable circumstances, having to trust God in new ways, to put out wings and say, God, is there really wind to carry me here? Is your spirit really there? Are you real, God? When you do that, you become very vulnerable and you learn to receive hospitality. Again, we've all been praying for those in the fire of the Marco Polo building and, and those that are grieving and the many people that will be displaced. They are now at, they're vulnerable without the security of their own home, needing people to take them in, needing to, to look at short-term and long-term shifts. Well, it's true when we step out, whether we go out in terms of with the gospel to another country, or whether we take mission or ministry initiatives and leadership here locally, there is a vulnerability in which we give up reliance on being self-sufficient and we become reliable on the hospitality of others. Hospitality is the foundation of mission. It's the foundation of discipleship. So in the same way, if you want to learn how to grow in being a disciple of Jesus, it's got to somehow get to you being able to receive other people's hospitality. Now, some of us struggle bringing people into our homes, and some of us struggle acting on hospitality. And I would guess that one of the reasons may be that you've never received it vulnerably the same way. And perhaps to open up the doors for you to be hospitable, you need to first learn to go without your suitcase and without your other things and to receive hospitality in the name of Jesus from someone else. Um, there is this trusting that God will provide through other, other people. And what we do, wherever God's people go, we bring a blessing. Amen? So wherever you go, what do you bring? A blessing. Wherever you go, what do you bring? You bring a blessing. Why? God has given you power over everything of the demonic. So wherever you go, if you're staying in someone's home and there's a demonic hole, you have the power to cleanse that place. Amen? Wherever you go, you have the power to bring the life and the healing of Jesus. Amen? Why? Because wherever you go, what do you bring? You bring a blessing. So that means that you bring the blessing of Jesus with you. So when someone welcomes you into their home, they are receiving a blessing. Because the presence and the blessing of Jesus comes with you if you're really walking with Jesus and you're living a selfless life. And so... And so when someone opens their home to you, you are blessed, they are blessed, and the spirit of hospitality stirs from the Holy Spirit into your heart and into their hearts. But then it says that because you're able to give them what money cannot buy. You know, we spend so much time getting money to get the stuff to fill our suitcases. But God has given us what no money can buy what no medical plan can do, what, what nothing, no high-paying job can do or provide. He has given you power over all demons and he has given you the power to heal. And you bring that in the name of Jesus, what money can't buy. You bring the love of God in the value and worth of an individual. You bring the wisdom of the word of God that brings clarity and life, and joy, and revives the soul. This is what the people of God bring wherever they go. And so when we, re we receive hospitality, it's not that we are parasites. It's that we are receiving physically, 
and we are pouring out the things of the kingdom back. But there's a, a second component. It says in Luke 9, 4, to stay in the one place. This is far more important than I think some people give credence to. If you go to uh, a, a new community where you're doing ministry or a new country, um, it is important that you are vulnerable and that the people who take you in, you stay there and you don't bounce from place to place. There are a couple of reasons for this. One, often the first people that invite you in are not the people with the four extra bedrooms and the extra car to give you to drive. Okay? It may be the person with the tent under the bridge. Say, hey, you can come stay with me. You can come stay in my tent. But the whole point is there's no upgrading. Once you stay somewhere, and then the person with the pool comes and says, hey, I'm on, I'm on the ocean. I got a pool. You want to come stay with me? You say, no, thank you. I've already got my place I'm staying. You stay in the same place that first opens up to you because that's where the heart of God has been revealed to you and opened the opportunity for ministry. And in the kingdom of God, we are not looking at trying to advance from uh, an okay place to a better place to a really nice place to the best place. No, we are content with where we are because what we are about is not the acquiring of stuff or of ease. So there's three reasons to stay in the one place. One, to build the relationship and to let the relationship grow. Two, for protection. Security, we're very concerned about security when we go into various places that may not understand or be friendly to the gospel. Your best security is that you are living with people. Those of you going on short-term mission, uh, we just taught this in the course today, that the, the number one priority is you don't want to be staying in hotels, you don't want to be staying in, in other places. Where do you want to be staying? In people's homes. Why? That's where relationship happens. And that's also where the safety of the culture and the people and the love of God is. The protection. Relationship protection and integrity. So trust provision through God's people. That's why it's important that God's people first in this discipleship. We gather together and respond to the call. And then when we're sent out we find this new gathering together of God's people as he works wherever we are sent out to. But then he says in verse 4, we're to shake off rejection. If people do not welcome you, I lived much of my life in fear of rejection. <laughs> so if you're there, you've got a good friend in me. Most of us are afraid of inviting someone to church because, well, what if they don't want to come? even though we know that 8 out of 10 people who are invited will come. And you say, well, I invited 8 people, no one came. I got the rejection. Well, rejection is very real in the kingdom. And Jesus prepares us for it. And he says, hey, if rejection comes, don't let it stick to you. Don't let it identify your value of good or bad or success or failure. Shake it off. Because your value is in your relationship with Jesus. Your value is, has been nailed to the cross through the blood of Christ. You've been purchased with his blood. So just because someone says no, or someone ridicules you, or you feel rejected, does not mean you're any different of a person in God's sight. You've got to shake that off. And some of us, unfortunately, we let that rejection stick to us. And then we let it change how we operate and how we do ministry in the future. No. Jesus says, don't let that stick to you. Just wipe it off. Leave your blessing. But move on. And this is part of, of trusting God in the process of discipleship. Shake off. Don't let that impact go past your skin and into your heart. Trust God to provide, not only through people, but to provide this cleansing from rejection if it comes up. It's hard to be rejected. And finally, get out there. <laughs> Jesus goes through all this. He calls them together, and he gives them authority, and he gives them power. And then he tell, tells them to be vulnerable, not to take anything, but to stay with the people that, that first welcome them in. 
Then when they're rejected, hey, don't let that deter you. Keep on going. And then it says, he sends them out. And they go. And they proclaim the good news. And they heal people everywhere. I want to pray for us in discipleship. Some of you have not answered the ultimate question of who is Jesus. And some of you, if you say, why, why does God have you alive in this world? You really don't know how to answer it. And, and we want to pray that, that God will settle those two things in your hearts. One, who is Jesus? Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? He's the one, is he the one really guiding and directing you? And that my purpose in my life, God, is wherever I am, wherever you send me, is to be used by you to love and to bless, to push back the powers of the demonic, and to bring in the life and the healing in Jesus. Lord, I want to be someone that can pray for people, and when we pray, they're healed. I want to be someone who can go where there's no Christians, and when we pray, we bring the life of the Holy Spirit, and people come to Christ. Amen? We want to be people who can go into the marketplace, and the light of Christ shines through us, in the quality of the work we do, and in the way, and the manner, and the demeanor in which we treat people. Amen? And this comes in Christ. So I want to pray for that. And then I want to pray an empowering, that God will give us power. It's not about your ability. It's not even about your gifting. It's about his supernatural power and the authority to use the name of Jesus to bring life into other people's lives. Will you pray with me? Let's stand together. We receive from the Lord. Father, um, I'm sure there are people here, Lord, who haven't taken that first step in discipleship of answering the question of who you are, Jesus. And, and that you are the mighty King of kings. The Lord of lords, Holy Spirit, come and reveal yourself. We would not be like Herod, who's looking to the occult or magic to explain your power and your love. Lord, that we wouldn't be like the crowds that are ignorant and blind. But Lord, we would be like Peter, who says, You, you God, as we look into your eyes, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And Lord, we surrender our lives to you that our purpose and our fulfillment, every desire you've placed in our hearts finds their yes in knowing you. So there may be someone today who has never ever said, Jesus, you, you are Lord and you are my savior. You may want to say that with me right now. Jesus, you are Lord and you are my Savior. Let's try it one more time. Jesus, you are Lord, and you are my Savior. Now, Father, I pray that you will work out your high, high calling for each of these disciples. And, Father, that there would be anointing with power now. Lord, that we would no matter how nervous we get as you nudge us towards the edge of that nest, Lord, there's some people that, that need to say, Lord, I will trust that your power will carry me when I step out in your name. And so, Lord, we ask you to do that now, to anoint with power, to step out and to trust that your Holy Spirit is not going to let us fall. But rather, Lord, you're going to lead us into whole new areas of glory and of wonder and of marvel. And Father, I pray for authority. So many people say, it's not my right, it's not my business, it's not my place, it's for someone else to do. But Lord, we pray for the authority of Jesus in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to send out these wonderful disciples here this morning. Lord, to use us to touch people that 
aren't following you, that don't know you, their lives are broken, and they need your healing, and they need your love. Lord, to heal families and to heal communities. Father, if we don't go, who will? And so, Lord, give us not only the power over all demons, but the authority, Lord, to heal and to bring life in the name of Jesus. Make that the mark of Kalihi Union Church. That, Lord, whether we're little children or whether we're old or whether we're sick, whether we're strong, God, that you send us out. And we go with your power and we go with your authority. Lord, we thank you. And thank you, you've got everything in place for us. It's all there waiting. And thank you that you've got the people to love, to welcome us. It's all there in place. And Lord, when we hit the rejection, Father, just, just let it flow off us. And let's keep on in the joy and the life of Jesus. Thank you, Father. We worship you, we praise you. And we say in Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue. Aloha, my name is Jonathan Steeper. I'm the senior pastor at Kalihinian Church. I'd like to welcome you to come and visit us. We are a family where we hope you'll meet and hear God and develop relationships with his people. Please come and join us at any of our Sunday services, our weekly gatherings, or our many special events. We look forward to meeting you and growing in faith, hope, and love together. Mahalo, and may God bless you.